I'm going to read the entire text in verses 13 to 16. Will you follow with me in your Bibles? Jesus speaking said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. The city that's set on the hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it gives light to all that are in the house. Verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. In the Beatitudes, which we've just covered the last eight weeks, Jesus has described the essential character of all those who are living in the kingdom of heaven. Now Jesus, using two metaphors, salt and light, he indicates the kind of influence that we will have for good in the world. In other words, he goes from being the Beatitudes to doing salt and light. Before you can have an influence on the world around you, you must be those beatitudes. You must have that poor of spirit. You must mourn over your sins. You must be meek. You must hunger and thirst after righteousness. You must be pure in heart. You must be a peacemaker. And when you find those beatitudes are true of you, then you will have an impact for good on the culture that is around you. So Jesus moves from being... To doing. Notice it's interesting in verse 12. He says, great is your reward in heaven. That's how he ended the Beatitudes. Great is your reward in heaven. But then notice in verse 13 and verse 14, you are the salt of the earth. And verse 14, you are the light of the world. So we move from great is your reward in heaven to you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of of the world. So we go from our focus on heaven to what we are here on earth. Now, it's the believer's blessed privilege and mandate to exert upon the world in which they live a saving and helpful influence. The world is decaying, we are salt. The world is dark, we are light. The inference here when Jesus said you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world, the inference is is that the world is decaying, and we need to be a preserving influence. When he says you're the light of the world, it's indicating the world is dark, and we need to shine brightly for Jesus Christ. So he's talking about the church's mission in the world and how we influence it. It's tempting, though, to dismiss the idea that the people described in the Beatitudes, verses 3 to 10, could influence the world. How is it that these kind of people, poor and meek and hungry and those that are merciful, those that are peacemakers, how how could they influence a world? Well, Jesus didn't share that skepticism. Looking at this humble handful of faithful followers, Jesus said, and by the way, still in the second person and emphatically, notice verse 13 and 14, you and you only are the salt of the earth. Verse 14, you and you only are the light of the world. Now these are fishermen. These are Galilean peasants. These aren't highly educated individuals. This is a rag tag bunch of men and women in this group. And he says, you and you only, no one else. You and you only are the salt of the earth. You and you only are the light of of the world. And I believe that the same is true today. That Jesus would look over this congregation and he would say to us that are here, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And you think about that, me? Yes, you. If you are a child of God living in the kingdom of heaven, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. It reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, where Paul says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has actually chosen the weak things, the base things, the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. Why? So that no flesh will glory in his presence. So God chooses the weak and despised so that he will be glorified. The same is true of us today. Now let's look together at these two metaphors of salt and light 
and seek to understand what our mission is in the world around us. First of all, in verse 13, blessed are those who are salt and light. Notice in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its savor or saltiness, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Now, what did Jesus mean by you are the salt of the earth? Well, we need to understand what salt meant to the ancient world. Today, we have salt in our salt shakers. We have salt everywhere. We have salt in our food. Uh, Nutritionists are saying we have too much salt in our food. But in the ancient world, salt was highly prized and very valuable. The Greeks believed that it contained something almost divine. In the Roman world, they actually sometimes paid their soldiers in salt. You've heard the old expression, he's not worth his salt. That's where it comes from. So you'd be a soldier, you get your pay, you get a big bag of salt, take it home, honey, here's my paycheck, you know, you got a big, big bag of salt. And you want it to be worth your salt. So salt was a very precious, very highly valued commodity in the ancient world. But what was salt used for? What was his primary purpose? And what did Jesus have in mind? Let me mention a few. Well, first of all, salt was used as a seasoning agent. That's no surprise. Salt was used to bring zest and spice to food. In the book of Job, chapter 6, verse 6, it says, Can flavorless food be eaten without salt? The answer, no. I share that verse with my wife. She's always trying to get me off salt, you know. You don't, you don't need salt. It's in the Bible. You ever tried to eat eggs without salt? Blah. Or pepper. I have a friend that puts so much pepper on his eggs, you don't even know there's eggs underneath the pepper. It's like a big anthill or something. You know? But you got to spice it up. So perhaps, and I don't think primarily this is what Jesus had in mind, but when he said, you are the salt of the earth, perhaps he had the idea that we should bring zest and flavor to life by the way that we live. Christians, someone said, are to be the condiments of life. I like that. You want a hot dog without mustard? Not me. The more, the better. Spicier, the better. So Christians are to bring spice and zest to life. Remember, sin leads to sadness and holiness leads to happiness. Jesus brings joy to life. But they also use salt to create thirst. Even today, Arabs will take salt and force themselves to eat it so that they will drink and avoid dehydration caused by the hot desert. They would take this salt and they would eat it so that they would be thirsty and remember to drink. I, I, I have the challenge in my own life. I, I, I don't really, I'm not a big fan of water. I don't like water. Water bores me, but I know you need to drink water. So that's another thing my wife tells me to do. Have you drank water today? Yes, I drink water. But it doesn't excite me. But if you don't drink water, you get hydrated, right? So you eat potato chips to get salty to drink water, which is supposed to be good for you. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that in. Praise God. It creates thirst. And I believe that we should live our Christian life in such a way that we should create a thirst in others. You know, some Christians live so sadly and so joyously and so depressed that no one would want what they've got like a disease. If that's a Christian, keep away. I don't want it. There was a survey of unchurched or unbelievers asking them why they don't go to church. These are the three top reasons. Number one, the church is always asking for money. Number two, they're always sad. And number three, they're always talking about death. It was the poet and author Robert Louis Stevenson that said in his diary with surprise, I have been to church today and I'm not depressed. <laughs> he was like amazed. Wow, I actually went to church and I'm not depressed. Isn't that amazing? But thirdly and lastly, salt was primarily used as a preservative. And I believe most likely that Jesus is speaking of this when he says you are the salt of the earth. And what Jesus had in mind, and by the way, the goal of my preaching and the goal of Bible study is always to get to the meaning of a text, 
not to impose what we mean, what we want it to mean, but what Jesus meant. And Jesus doesn't really say, he says, you are the salt of the earth, but he doesn't tell us in what way we're salty, what, what the significance is. But the number one purpose and use for salt and value of salt in the ancient world, even not too far off in our modern world, was that it was used as a preservative. In Jesus' day, obviously, there was no refrigeration. There was no ice chest. There were no ice. There was no way to keep their meat fresh. And so they would salt it down as a preservative, like we might do with jerky or something like that, to keep the meat from putrefying. The fishermen in Galilee would catch their fish. They would pack it in salt and they would ship it down to Jerusalem. You ever been in the Midwest somewhere a long way away from the ocean and you see on the restaurant menu that they have sea fish or they have fish from the ocean? You think, well, where did they get it? It must take days for it to get here. I, I don't think it's safe, but we have refrigeration. So they would transport their fish and their meat by packing it in salt. David Livingston, the great missionary to Africa, his body was sent from Africa to England where it was buried in Westminster Abbey and he was packed in salt. But before he left Africa, they took out his heart and they planted his heart in Africa. But to preserve his body, they put it in salt. So we Christians are to be a preserving influence on the decaying world in which we live. Now here's an implication that I've already hinted at. The implication is, if we're to be a preserving influence on a decaying world, the implication is the world is decaying. Jesus doesn't mention it, but it's implied very clearly. The world is decaying. We're going to see in a moment, you're the light of the world. The world is dark. So the world is two things. It's decaying and it is dark. So you need to be salt, excuse me, and you need to be light. It doesn't take long in the book of Genesis for man to fall and for Cain to kill his brother Abel. It doesn't take long after that that we have the time of Noah. And think about it. God said the earth was so corrupt that he was going to wipe out all flesh upon the earth. He would only save Noah and his family, <laughs> eight souls in the ark. I actually happen to believe that story is true. I believe that there was an actual literal guy named Noah, and he actually built a big old honking boat. In the Hebrew, it's the word honking. <laughs> I'm kidding. But it was a big honking boat. I don't know where we get that term, honk, honk. Big old honking boat. And God brought the animals two by two into the ark. And then the rain came down and Noah and his wife were in the ark and God shut the door. The ark is a symbol of Christ. Only one door, only one way to be saved through Jesus. So they entered in the ark and the rains came down. The fountains of the deep were broken up. And think about that. The entire world, and I, I believe the flood was universal. I think God would have Noah build a big boat if he could have just move into the next town? I doubt it. So the whole world was destroyed by a flood. Which, by the way, people get upset with God. Whoa, that's not nice. Why would God destroy the world? And, you know, the Bible says that God will yet still do it again, not by flood, but by fire. The environmentalists are freaking out, trying to take care of the earth, and so we should. But wait till you see what God's going to do to it. It's gonna, the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. But God owns it all by right of He is the Creator but he destroyed all flesh. Why? Because it became corrupt. And then you come down to Sodom and Gomorrah. The wickedness of man was so great. He couldn't even find ten righteous people in the city. So Lot and his family were spared. But God rained down fire and brimstone on the city. And then you see the deterioration described in Paul's book to the Romans chapter 1. Read Romans chapter 1. Where it talks about man starting with a knowledge of God knowing God, but didn't want to retain God in his knowledge. Instead, he turned away from God, and he degenerated down to a perverted lifestyle, and therefore God gave him over to a reprobate mind. That's pretty much where we are on the scale right now in America, by the way. 
We basically have a nation of reprobates. By the way, the word reprobate literally means does not work, doesn't function. Their minds don't function. They don't know right from wrong. They don't know good from evil. And we're sadly watching the decaying of our own nation. In the years that I've been a pastor, I've watched the decline. We've seen the decline of marriage as a divine institution. You know, God has given other restraining influences on society. Let me mention them if you're taking notes. There's first the state with its authority to frame and enforce laws. I, I thank God that we still have laws in America. I hope we live by those laws. And we have the ability to frame our laws. And we should have laws that reflect God's moral standards in the Bible. But God has given us the state as the authority. I thank God for the police department. Amen? Thank God for our peace officers. And that they're there to enforce the laws for our protection. The second is the family. God has given it as a divine institution with marriage as its foundation and parental influence in the home. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with the promise. You know that the family is a God-ordained, God-designed institution? And you know that its foundation is? Genesis chapter 1, for this cause a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two become one flesh. Marriage is one man with one woman. Jesus said that specifically in Matthew chapter 19. In Matthew 19, when he was talking about marriage, he said God made them male and female. He used those terms, male and female, and said a man will leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and the two become one flesh. As goes marriage, so goes the family. As goes the family, so goes our nation. One of the reasons for so many of the social ills in our nation today is because of the breakdown in the family. We don't even know how to define marriage. We don't understand that it's a divine institution, that you can't change something God has established. One man with one woman for life, raising children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And then thirdly, this is what our text ties in with, and that is the church. So there's the state, there's the family, and there's the church. And without redeemed, regenerate, and righteous people, these God-ordained institutions can never affect the moral decay of sinful society. We Christians are to be a moral disinfectant. And by the way, I believe that the church works with the family and the family with the church. They're not in competition. Sometimes you think, well, you know, we get too busy at church and it, it disrupts our family, and I can understand that. Or the church is to be a blessing to the family and the family is to be a blessing to the church. This church should encourage and strengthen and bless your family, your marriage and your family. And you should bless and strengthen and encourage this church. We're not working against each other. We're working with each other to be salt and light in our world, in our culture, and in our society. But the effectiveness of the believer as salt is conditional. Listen to me very carefully. There's some conditions that we must keep. Number one, salt must come into contact with the culture. We can't live in isolation from the world. Jesus said, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Salt must come out of the salt shaker. Amen? Doesn't do any good if it just sits in the salt shaker. Why have, why have, why have salt on the table if you're not going to use it? <laughs> Let's use that sucker. Let's spice that food up. I know it's maybe not the best thing for you, but hey. It's there. That's the purpose. Let's use it. So Christians are to get out of the salt shaker. We need to break out of our holy huddle. Jesus said, go ye into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel. So you're all gathered here today, and we call this the holy huddle, but then after church is over, you leave. And don't, don't, don't go try to find some Christian sanctified Holy Ghost filled restaurant to eat at. 
Make sure that the waitress is born again, you know, and the cook is redeemed by the blood of Jesus and everything's sanctified, you know, go, go somewhere where there's heathens there and let your light shine. Be polite, give a generous tip. Well, we came from Revival Christian Fellowship and, uh, you know, waitresses say the worst tippers are Christians after church on Sunday. It ought not to be. If you're not going to tip good, don't tell them you came from this church, okay? <laughs> You know that revival church down there? That's where we came. A bunch of chiefscapes. <laughs> Amen? Be a blessing. Be a blessing. And be salt and be light. And permeate the culture that is around us. We must come into contact with our culture. We need Christian high school teachers, middle school teachers, elementary teachers, principals, we need Christians in the White House. We have some in the White House. Praise God for that. We need Christians in the Senate. We need Christians in the House of Representatives. We need, we need a Christian governor of California. Amen. Wouldn't that be awesome? We need Christian policemen. We need Christian lawyers. We even need Christian used car salesmen. Let's pray for that right now. In the, in the name of Jesus. We need Christians in every sphere of life. That's what he means here when he says, you're the salt of the earth. We have to get out of the salt shaker. But listen to me. Secondly, we need as salt to be careful that we are not contaminated by the culture. So let me explain this. We should make contact with the culture you're in the world, but you don't want to be of the world. But we shouldn't be contaminated by the culture. Jesus ate with prostitutes and harlots and wicked people, but he wasn't contaminated by them. He gave an influence on them. When he went to the home of Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was converted and he gave half of his goods to the poor. And Jesus said, today salvation's come to this house. So when we go out and we rub shoulders with the world, we need to be a purifying effect upon our culture. So, but we don't want to be polluted or contaminated. Now, how does salt lose its saltiness? Verse 13, he says, if the salt loses its savor or saltiness. Now, scientists kind of chide Jesus here by saying he's not scientific, that salt doesn't lose its saltiness. And some critics of the Bible have actually attacked this and said it's, it's unscientific. Salt doesn't lose its, its, its basic content or saltiness. But I, I believe what Jesus had in mind is that it becomes contaminated by mixture. If you get dirt in the salt or foreign subject in the salt, then it becomes polluted or becomes contaminated. The danger for the church is that the, the world comes into the church. The church is to be in the world but the world's not to be in the church. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said it like this, the influence of Christians in and on society demands on their being distinct from society. Not the same, but being distinct. So we have contact, but we don't become contaminated. We go into the world, but we're not like the world. We live the Beatitudes. We live the Sermon on the Mount. And when we do, we're different and we have an impact. So ask yourself, have I lost my saltiness? Is there anything distinctly different about me? Do I spend my money just like a non-Christian? Do I spend my time like a non-Christian? Do I think like a non-Christian? Do I act like a non-Christian? Do I talk like a non-Christian? Can people look at me and go, there is a child of God? They're meek and they're humble and they're merciful and they're poor in spirit and they show love to other people? Can they see Christ in you? Are you being the salt of the earth? Someone said the great tragedy is that so often the world does the church more harm than the church does the world good. How true that is. The world does the church more harm than the church does the world good. When the great Francis Schaeffer, before he passed and went to heaven, he said, tell me what the world is saying. 
And in seven years, he predicted, the church will say the same thing. He, 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 he concluded that the church is following the world. Tell me what the world's saying, and you watch. The church will be saying the same thing. All the trends, all the fads, all the ideas that are popularized in the world, then we pick them up and go, well, well Christians can do that too. We can Christianize that. We can, we can. We've lost our distinctiveness. Now, I'm not saying we go out in the world and we're corny or we're weird, and I don't believe we should all live in a monastery. I believe that we need to get out of the salt shaker. But it's our distinctiveness and the way we think and talk and act and live that gives us impact on the culture that is around us. Now he moves to the second metaphor, and that is, excuse me, that of the light, verse 14 to 16. You are the light of the world, the city that's set on the hill, cannot be hid. Now, men do not light a candle, and it's actually a reference to a lamp. They didn't have wax candles, and put it on a, put a bushel over it or a basket over it, but you put it on a lamp stand that it may give light to all that are in the house. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So, number one, the world is decaying. We need to be salt. Go out and be salt. Be distinct, but make contact. Secondly, the world is dark, and we need to be light. Now, again, in verse 14, you are the light of the world. In the Greek, it's emphatic. So it's you and you only. No one else. You are the only ones. You're the light of the world. You say, well, Pastor John, I, I thought Jesus was the light of the world. He is. In John 8, verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But someone used the illustration that's so cool. Jesus is like the sun and we're like the moon. You know, the moon doesn't have its own light. It reflects the light of the sun. When you see a moon, it's reflecting the light of the sun. So Jesus is the sun, and we are moons. We are to reflect the light of Jesus Christ. And we are to be super moons in this dark world, right? You know, if you really want to enjoy a bright moon, you go out when the, it's very dark, and the moon glows, and the big super moons are so amazing. Now, it is true that once we become believers, Christ lives in us, and we become lights in ourself. Ephesians 5 verse 8, for we were sometimes darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, so walk as children of light. But that light still comes from God. That light is still Christ within us. But what we need to do is let that light shine out. Now, I want to, from this text, show us how we are to shine. If you're taking notes, you can write them down. How should we shine in this dark world? Number one, we should shine openly. Notice the end of verse 14 and verse 15. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. And men do not, not light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but they put it on a lampstand that it may give light to all that are in the house. So Jesus is saying here that when you have a city set on a hill, I was reading about the city of Quito in Ecuador. It sits about 9,000 feet elevation. And for 75 miles away, they get the light from the city of Quito in Ecuador. I grew up in San Bernardino at the foot of the mountains up there. You know, and on a clear night, you can see the lights in the cabins. You can see the lights in certain places up there, and it cannot be hid. So when a city is set up on a hilltop, the light radiates out. It can't be hid. What Jesus is trying to convey is the purpose of light is to do what? Give light. Then he moves to the next illustration, that of a lamp. Now, they didn't have wax candles, so they were like lamps. They were filling with olive oil. They had a little wick. They fill them with olive oil. They light the wick. They put them on a lamp stand. Now, the reason you light a lamp was to give light to the house. No one would go to the store, buy light bulbs, and say, these are light bulbs, but they we're not supposed to use them. Just going to put them in a drawer, and don't put them in a lamp and don't turn them on. No, when you bring a light bulb home, you put it in a lamp, you screw it in, you flick on the light, because the purpose of a lamp is to give light, right? You wouldn't buy a lamp, you wouldn't put a bulb in it and then go hide it in the closet, go, I just want to leave it there, I don't want to use it for its purpose. And when you turn that light on, what happens to the darkness when the light comes on? 
the darkness leaves, right? You want to get darkness out of a room, what do you do? Get a stick and start beating the darkness? No. You just turn the light on. When you turn the light on, the darkness has to leave, right? So you're in a dark, dark world and getting darker every day. The Bible says that we're to shine as lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. So we are to shine openly. We're not to be cowardice or compromising. Purpose of light is to give light to everyone that is in the house. When you go to your job, when you're in your neighborhood, when you're in your home, let Christ shine through you and from you. Secondly, we're to shine openly. Notice it in verse 16. In verse 16, let your light shine before men. Sometimes Christians get the idea that it's kind of Christ of the secret order. I had a guy one time say, I've been on the job for a whole year and it's really good right now. They still don't know I'm a Christian. And you think that's good? Yeah, I've been there a whole year and they haven't busted me reading my Bible yet. You're supposed to let your light shine. Now, you don't want to be obnoxious. I'm a Christian! I read the Bible! You're all so weird. I encourage you when you meet somebody, don't, don't, don't wait to just say, hey, I'm a Christian. Hey, I love Jesus. Hey, are you born again? Hey, what's going on? I was talking with a guy the other day that didn't know I was a Christian, and I, I said, praise the Lord. He looked at me like, whoa, what came out of your mouth? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus, and I praise the Lord. God is good. Just let your light shine. So you're to shine openly. Let your light shall shine before men. Don't put it under a bushel. Don't cover it. And then thirdly, verse 16, we should shine beautifully. And I love this. He said that you, they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, Jesus used an interesting Greek phrase when he used the word good works. He didn't use the word good in quality. He used the word good in it's beautiful, it's lovely. Now, it would be good in quality, but you're doing it in a lovely or beautiful way. So what Jesus actually said is, he says, let them see your beautiful or attractive or lovely works. Isn't that awesome? He wants us to have a beautiful life. He wants us to live attractively before the world. And we're saved not by works, but we are saved unto good works. Paul, writing to the Philippians, said in chapter 2 that they should work out their salvation with fear and trembling, for God works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And he said, do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, listen carefully, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights. So we live in a crooked and perverse nation and we are to shine as lights. But there's a fourth and last way we are to shine. Notice in verse 16, we are to shine for the glory of God. Notice how Jesus closes this section. He said, they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. So he tells us what to do. Live a beautiful life, good works, the fruit of your salvation. He tells us why to do it, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You know that God saved you for his glory? God didn't save you because you're awesome. Yes, I just said that. <laughs> God didn't save you because he needed you. If God needed me, he's in big trouble. God didn't save me because he's lonely. I hear sometimes people say, God didn't want to have heaven. He didn't want to be all alone, so he saved us. Listen, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost who have been around for eternity, they're fine without you and I, okay? They don't need you and I to heaven to repave the streets of glory or anything. God saved you for his glory. Read Ephesians chapter 1. Three times 
when it talks about being saved by, elected by God the Father, redeemed by God the Son, and sealed by God the Holy Spirit, all three of those times he goes, to the praise of the glory of his grace who first trusted in Christ. When we get to heaven, there'll be no bragging there, right? There'll be no bragging about what I did to get heaven. I think when you get to heaven, people are going to be surprised to see you. <laughs> They're going to go, what are I, we went to high school together. What are you doing here? You were messed up. And they're going to look at you and go, you were super messed up. It's the grace of God, amen? The grace of God. And everything God does is for his glory. Everything. So you leave here today and you are salt in a decaying world. Don't lose your saltiness. Be in contact, but do not become contaminated. You are the light of the world, you and you only. And we live in a world that's living in darkness. Let your light so shine before men that they can see your beautiful deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Amen?